Hi, uh, welcome to Astro Journey UK. Um, in today's video, I'm going to be uh, taking a look at uh, Pix Insight, but from the lens of um, the complete beginner. Um, it's a video that I've been meaning to do for quite some time. I mean, I've been uh, using Pix Insight probably for about a year, year and a half. Um, I'm, I'd say I've moved away from the beginner territory, definitely not an expert. Um, but I think because I'm in that area now, I think that's a sweet spot for being able to go back and sort of showing uh, people new to Pix Insight um, that it's not as scary as it, it sort of initially uh, initially feels. So uh, if you're new to Pix Insight and you want to learn more, then uh, keep watching. So uh, I remember what it uh, first felt like when I downloaded and opened up the application. Um, you're presented with um, basically this, uh, not not really too much. Obviously, uh, there's no image open at the moment. Um, there's a few items in the toolbar, um, but yeah, it's kind of well, what, where do I go next? So first, we'll open up an image. Uh, we won't do anything with it right now. Um, but at least it's got the context of something's loaded and then you can see some of these buttons are actually open uh, or enabled. There's uh, the, the main parts of the user interface, so you've obviously got the toolbar in the same way that you would with uh, many other applications and there's lots of things in here, there's some useful things that are quite sort of um, there on hand, I mean extract CE CIEL component is like, well, what on earth's that? And split RGB channels. Maybe you might understand what that might do. Um, but uh, we'll we'll not go through those um, in this particular session. The idea is to just get you up and running. Um, you can work around and understand a few simple things. And then once you've done that, then you can then gradually build upon things. Um, there's lots of icons here in terms of uh, changing how you sort of view the or how the curse is going to work, whether it's going to provide you with um, some information about uh, what you're actually sort of clicking on at the point in time. Um, zooming in and out, uh, there's some things called previews, which we'll get onto later on as well. Um, zooming around the image, yeah, zoom to fit and things, and then you've got some more preview creating icons over here. The first time you open the image, you're you're literally presented with something that's just black, and you think, well, hang on a minute, that's not what I was expecting after I'd um, gone to the effort of stacking an image and then bringing it into here. Um, so what do you do? What's the first thing? Um, and the point here is around um, sort of linear and non-linear images. Um, so when you've got a stacked image, um, it's in this format called uh, linear. So a very simple explanation of what linear imaging means is that um, each time a photon hits the sensor, uh, that, that's recorded and the value uh, for that particular pixel is then incremented. So if you get two photons, then the, the value will increase uh, proportionally to the number of photons hitting that part of the sensor. Um, apparently it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's that's to give you a rough idea of what linear image means. So uh, all digital sensors, whether that's dedicated astrophotography cameras or digital SLRs, they all record um, the, the data and the photons hitting sensor in a linear manner. Uh, human senses, however, are, are not linear. They're, they're close to sort of something like logarithmic scale. Um, so the eye expects to see something that is is using that sort of logarithmic curve, um, and that's why it's called non-linear. So whenever you open an image from a uh, from a camera, for example, the raw data from the sensor will be in that linear um, format, and you need to do something with it. Um, when you're uh, shooting a, a photo on your camera and it produces a JPEG image, what the camera is actually doing there is um, applying a, a non-linear uh, curve or nonlinear stretch to that data to be able to provide you with an image that you can see. But how do you get to see something that you've actually got? There are these four buttons here, um, which are a good place to start. Um, there's a little uh, button here with a nuclear symbol, and if you click that, it will just basically auto stretch this image. And then you'll think, well, oh great, it's green. Why is it green? <laughs> um, but uh, we'll get to that, and we'll we'll sort of um, process this and and be able to sort these these things out as well. Um, there's two stretch functions. There's like an auto stretch, and then there's an aggressive stretch. 
Um, most of the time the auto stretch is fine to just work with the image whilst you're still in this linear workflow. If you want to go back and for whatever reason um, there's a, a clear function here which takes it back. So you're not you're not changing the image in any way, shape or form at this point in time. You're just changing what you're previewing. So that's important to know as well. Um, there are some other um, items here in terms of enable and disable screen transfer function which effectively is the same as clicking on this and clicking on this. I think the point to take away from this is yes there are lots of items in here in the toolbar but in reality and um, this is for me as well I use very few of these most of the time I'll use these four buttons here um, when I do have to create uh, previews of areas within an image I tend to use a keyboard shortcut so most of the time I don't actually use these toolbar um, items because they're not really in the workflow that I use. So moving on to the, uh, I guess the menu would be a sensible place to go next. Uh, lots of things in here, some of which um, eventually you'll get to, but um, again I've not, most of my time I either spend in um, the mask menu, process menu and the script menu. There's one useful item in the file menu which is the fit header. Um, so if you've stacked your images um, and they come from a, um, a dedicated astrophotography camera, then you'll have a fit image and it'll have some information in that um, image. So a fit image is essentially uh, the actual image itself and then there's lots of metadata on that image. So there's, there's information or data about the data. So it will be things like what the shutter, sp or, um, or what the exposure time was, whether you were using a particular filter for that image what the camera was, what the Bayer format and pattern is. Um, so again, you won't really tend to come in here and look at this, but it's just nice to know that this exists. For fits images as well, you also have the actual coordinates of the image, and, and sometimes things within PixInsight will actually use that information to, um, uh, to handle processing. So it might be if you're doing something to do with color calibration, there's a uh, particular feature in here which allows you to do color calibration based on the exact part of the night sky that you've imaged, for example. Um, other aspects of this, you've got um, Process Console, which pops in and out all the time. And to be fair, to be fair I never really look at it. Um, so most of the time, I end up clicking the X to get rid of it. There's a File Explorer, so you can go in and um, open your files, which mm, could be useful, but I don't tend to use that. And then also there's a history explorer as well to be able to go back through things that you've done in the past. Again, maybe for an advanced user, but um, beginner users, I don't think really you're going to end up using any of those things. Um, down the bottom here, you've got sort of um, a quick access to different views. So if you've got different files open, you can select those. And you've got different workspaces as well. So think of these as different windows in the application so you can tidy things up more. Again, you must be imaging or handling lots of um, image data to feel the need to work with multiple workspaces. Um, and then you'll see on the right hand side, there's this strange little bar thing here. What's what's that all about? And this is essentially, uh, we'll go through this in a bit. Um, when you create or use processes, they're like um, activities or functions or operations on that um, your image in terms of manipulating it and processing it, um, you can keep like shortcuts to those um, on the right hand side that enables you to um, be able to go back to them again. So uh, just to show you very quickly, um, I can load my process icons that I have. Um, so they're all stored in one file and you can have different um, sets of process icons for uh, different activities. At the moment I tend to just have it all for one or for every type of file that I might uh, be editing but actually there's in thinking about it and doing this video I think there's actually a nicer way of doing this. Um, so for example this is a one-shot color um, image because it's one-shot color all of the red green and blue data is already merged into that image um, so there's aspects of um, say star alignment say so you've got um, a separate set of red images, separate set of um, green and blue. Um, through dithering and through um, just, I don't know, potentially maybe not quite setting up the kit exactly the same night by night, you might find that those images don't completely align with each other. 
um, so you'd use star alignment. However, for a one-shot color image like this one, uh, you don't tend to need to use star alignment. So just quickly as well, star alignment is um, if you've got two images of the same subject, say the veil nebula that you've got here, um, if they're not exactly aligned with each other, you can just use this piece of functionality, give it a couple of images, and it will create you a new set of images that do completely line up with each other, such that when you merge them together to create a colour image, you um, everything looks as it needs to be. If you compare that kind of activity with um, using, say, something like Photoshop, Yes, you can do that in Photoshop. You can stretch it and transform it and move it around, but my goodness, it's a lot of work. Um, this is done um, almost instantaneously using this. Um, so it's things like that that make PixInsight um, what I would say is the go-to tool for any um, astrophotography um, image processing because it's, it's a dedicated tool for the job. Um, so I'm going to remove all of these icons and we're, we're going to... Um, start them from scratch. So I just right click on the background, you get this menu up. Um, so these are all called process icons. You can load them, merge them and save them to files, but we're just going to remove them. Um, so for a one shot colour um, image, the first thing you're going to want to do is to um, crop the image. If you happen to be using dithering or something like that, you'll find that um, the entire image isn't full of all of the data and you have to uh, and you have to crop that out. So if I just move into the corner of this image, right over in the corner, you can see all of this, um, this fuzziness, and that's where there's not complete data there. So we're going to need to crop that out. Um, I do tend to use uh, keyboard shortcuts, and these are worth remembering just to um, flip open the, uh, the window to the right size and things. So it would be um, either Control T and Control Zero, on Windows, and this is Mac, so it would be Command T uh, for that size window, and Command Zero for the, the larger view. So we're going to open the process of dynamic crop. So you could look down this menu, and you could maybe eventually find it. I still haven't learned all of these, um, so I do tend to go to all processes most of the time um, and find my uh, dynamic crop process here. So um, you've got a number of settings here, most of which um, I don't think I've ever touched or changed. Um, but what it does do is when you when you select the image, um, and this time I had to this little button here is reset. Um, so I selected the image, and it's it's now got the width information in here as well. And you see this little icon here, the little plus symbol, um, allows you to to move this around. Um, but before we make that change, what you can do is take this little triangle here, drag this onto the background, and it creates a new instance of this dynamic crop tool. So if you just close that, um, and this is the beginnings of you creating your workflow through processing your images. Um, so it's called Process 1, that's a bit of a random name, so we're going to rename that. And you have to right click on it, and then click Set Icon Identifier. You do that, and then you can call this uh, dynamic crop. Hit OK, and then you've got your first thing there. So what we'll do is we'll um, build this up over time, and you can place these wherever you want. Um, and it, this this little um, line here is is to distinguish between where the images work um, and are, and your processes. So typically you'd want to not use too much space with your processes, but it all depends on your screen resolution and things. So we'll double click on that again, and we can now um, crop out the sort of area of the image which has less data. I'm going to be quite slapdash with this because it's not really the importance of this uh, tutorial, so don't worry about how quick I'm doing this. So you've got these these things, these icons here at the bottom of every process. Um, you've got the new instance, which um, you tend to use if you want to drag it onto that image and apply it. Um, sometimes you use that. Sometimes there's a, a square, which is um, apply, um, apply to the open image. And then sometimes there's a circle, which is apply globally. 
some of these things are a little bit sort of like, well, what do I use when? And um, so it, that that's a bit of a peculiarity, I'd say, with PixInsight. It's not always that clear. Sometimes you have a, a, a box like this one where it's got a tick and a cross. Um, so actually, in order to apply um, this particular change in this crop, uh, you click the tick to execute it. Um, then it gives you a warning saying you can't um, can't undo this. So, yep, we're happy with that and just click yes. So we can just zoom into this upper right hand corner again. And you should see this time that those artifacts have gone because we haven't got them in the image anymore. So we're done with that one now. The next, the next process that you'd um, you'd want to use quite often is um, one called uh, background neutralization. Go up into all processes again. And you can see background neutralization. Um, this is a particularly powerful um, process just in the very beginnings of your workflow, um, just to get to an image that actually looks like what it's it needs to look like. So you won't have this um, crazy green. Um, tinge to this. Um, there are a number of ways of, of calling this. Sometimes you can um, sort of provide it with a, a reference image or like a preview area um, to do the background neutralization. However, most of the time I just literally take that triangle, drag it onto the image, um, and it applies background neutralization to the whole of the image. Um, don't be alarmed when this happens. After it's applied that, the, the preview image just um, never never looks right. Um, and you just have to click that little nuclear button, the auto stretch again, and you'll find that your image comes back and it's now beginning to look a bit more like you would want it to look. Um, so we're going to keep this one again. We're just going to drag that triangle onto the background, close the window, right click, set identifier, background, neutralization if I can type and I'm um, English so I'm going to put an S rather than a Z uh, so that's that one done so at least you can now see that it's beginning to look like a, uh, a nice image um, so that that's got rid of that green um, aspect of this uh, the next thing that you'll um, typically want to do will be to remove any kind of odd gradients that you might have in your image. Um, and there's a number of ways, uh, there's two main ways of doing this. Um, you've got a tool called Automatic Background Extractor, or um, it's referred to as ABE. Uh, that's a, a typical um, one that people tend to use. Um, and there's also one called the Dynamic Background Extractor. So these two tools both of them are very powerful. Both of them have their place. Um, think of the automatic one, <laughs> clues in the name. Uh, it's automatic. You just basically set a, a thing called a box size and a separation. Um, and then the, the, the key bits um, of applying a change to the image afterwards. And there's some things called subtraction and division, which again will mean uh, very little to most people, but I can explain a bit about what they or why they might be used in which situations. Um, so you can use the automatic one. Don't be fooled by the fact it's automatic, that it might not be that effective. I've seen examples, um, both sort of personally and on other videos, where sort of ABE actually works um, as effectively as um, DBE, or um, even better. So uh, you've got that as the automatic one, and then dynamic background extractor is, is one whereby um, you have to place all of the squares on automatically where it's going to be doing some sampling and things and all of the, the magic and maths behind the scenes. Um, but that one involves more time and effort and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a better um, removal of things like the, the gradients in the image and the light pollution that might be caused or the vignetting in your image. So uh, just, just factor that in. Um, so what we'll do, grab the triangle, uh, place this one onto here. Uh, I'm just going to call this DB just because it's quicker. And we're going to do the same here. And we're going to call this one ABE. 
for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm not going to go into DBE. Um, I might do a, a more detailed tutorial on that at some point, but um, for, for the purposes of this, we're just going to um, go with some sort of average uh, settings and we're just going to apply those. So um, when we say the box size, um, what that essentially means is um, when it's when it's going to be sampling this image, so it will create a, a box area, a virtual box in this image, it will sample that area and try and work out what what is the background and what is um, sort of light that's changing the darkness of the background and the color of the background that then needs to be removed. Um, and essentially what it will then do is it will create this sort of virtual image map um, and then when it applies the correction, um, and we'll do a subtraction in this case for light pollution, um, it will apply that model that it's created onto the image, subtract that from the image, and then you get a, um, a, a background neutralized image or extracted image. So um, when you run this, it's up to you as to whether or not you can keep all of the other settings the same. Um, certainly when you're starting out, it's not important. So you select um, subtraction to remove the uh, the gradients from light pollution. And um, you can normally click discard background model because to be fair, most people aren't going to do anything with it. I never do anything with it, but I'm going to leave that unchecked so you can see what it's doing. Um, and also you can say either replace the target image or create a new one. In this instance, I'm going to replace it because I'm just going to carry on working with that. So you grab the triangle, drag it onto the image and let go. So now it's done that. Um, so this is the background model. Yeah, it looks all a bit black. You just have to stretch it using the nuclear button and you can see this crazy pattern that's been created. And this is basically um, allowing you to remove the odd green bits of color there and some um, magenta -y ready bits there um, to, to create a flatter, a flatter image. So we've got that uh, kept, or this ABE is kept here. And um, one thing I forgot to mention is if you treat these processes that you're saving onto your background as um, or your your workspace as shortcuts but shortcuts with predefined settings so for for example ABE if um, you'll notice that when I reopened this it was it was set to five if actually what I'd done was um, set this to eight I'm just going to delete this one quickly I've set that to eight and then I drag the um, triangle onto the background and save that. Then when we just rename it again uh, so we can place it in the right place. Next time we open this it'll be set to 8. So when you come across some kind of settings and actually I should have changed this and done subtraction, discard and, and that, um, it just means that you have, to, you have to run it. So if we did something like um, <laughs> Sorry for the going around the houses a bit here. Uh, let's delete that one. This is our new automatic background extractor um, with our predefined settings. So you've got 8.8, eight, subtraction, scar background model, and replace target image. So if we just undo this, and you can see just the very subtle differences in terms of the image and what that background extractor has done. Um, so we're going to go back to the previous one. So now what you can actually do, you could you could open this and you can drag the triangle on there. Or also you can just take that process and just drop it straight onto the image, run it, and then that will do exactly the same thing. So I'm not saying that this is definitely the best way of doing things because what you will find whenever you're processing any kind of image, each each image needs to be processed in different ways. But at um, the purposes of what I'm showing here is just how to use the interface, how you can use the interface um, to, to manipulate and process your images. So the next key um, part in actually processing your images is, is making sure that the, the colors are 
reasonably accurate. So, um, and this is a process called color calibration. Uh, you've got a couple of um, tools, at least a couple of tools um, for color calibration. And and if you go into the, the menu and see color calibration, you can actually see that background neutralization is, is one of those aspects of color calibration. So uh, we've got um, two things that I'm just going to introduce you to very briefly. Uh, you've got color calibration and photometric color calibration. So if we open open color calibration first, um, and this is going to introduce um, the previews that I mentioned um, earlier and what they're used for. So you've got um, lots of um, scary settings in here again, and most of these I've literally never touched. Um, I've never never gone into changing upper and lower limits and things like that. All I ever focus on is um, providing a white reference point and a background reference point. So the way that I do that is um, select the image and then find a, a, good, a good star. Um, so I'm just going to zoom into the image and uh, let's pick this one down here. I press um, Alt N for, for PC or Option key and N to create a new preview. You see the mouse pointer changes. And then I'm just going to sort of left click and drag around that star and let go. And then that creates as a preview. And you can see that the preview is down here and there's some um, small version of what we've what we've just selected there. Um, and you can it eventually, uh, I might go into it later on, um, you use previews to be able to apply certain aspects to a small portion of your image as well. Um, so you can see the changes instantly rather than having to apply something that might be a quite a long um, process intensive process uh, to your image where it will take you a while to even see whether what you're doing is, is the right thing. So previews are they're very useful within PixInsight. Um, what we also need to do now is try and find an area in this image um, that looks like it's a good background. Um, so you want to find somewhere that doesn't particularly have any stars in it or has few stars um, that looks fairly neutral. So there's you don't want to select anywhere where there's any kind of um, nebula or um, sort of dust or anything like that. You want uh, the background of space. So we've got preview one is the white reference. So we click on that little box next to uh, target image at the top. In the drop down, we just select preview one, um, click OK, and then do the same for background preview two, click OK, and then we just uh, drag that on. Um, this is the same thing whereby you can do things like hitting apply. So you don't drag it onto there, but you can actually apply um, this to the open image. But if you've got multiple images open and things, it's always good to just be in the habit of um, dragging that triangle onto exactly what you want to um, apply the changes to. So if I open that back up again, if you just go back, you'll see the previous one. It's definitely got a bit of a green um, tint to it. Um, if we apply it, then you can see, I don't know if it's actually me, but there might be a slight magenta into it still as well, but um, not there to get a perfect image, just here to sort of show you the um, the ways of working and the things to do. Um, so what we can do there, let's, um, let's clear these out so that we can save this as a process, because um, in this particular instance, you are going to have to um, open this up and for each of your new images, you're going to have to specify the preview. Um, it's not one of those processes that can just be run all the time. Uh, so set icon identifier, color calibration. That's all good there. Um, now I've got a few of these. I'm just going to save this now. So go to process icons. So right clicking on the de on the workspace. Go to process icons. Save process icons and then find a suitable place for them. Uh, I'm just going to call these video process. Actually, let's call it one shot color processes. Uh, 
And once you've got that, you can keep that file backed up. And if you change your machines, you can just bring that in. And then you've got all of those settings in a nice, convenient place. Um, I did mention the other one, uh, which I will just, I won't use it, but I'll just explain it. So um, photometric, photometric color calibration is a, another useful tool. Um, I found that sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes it does. Um, so what this tool is doing is um, is taking the um, information, the location of your subject image, um, it's taking that data from the FITS header that you've got. Um, so if you've used a dedicated astrophotography camera um, and an imaging system that creates FITS images with the location of the object embedded in that file, you can just click on acquire from image and it will um, do that for you. And then also it's, um, yeah, it, it pulls out the observation date, the focal length, and also the pixel size for you. Um, and then is populating the, the coordinates there. Um, you need those in there such that when you, um, let's close this down, when you run this process against that, it's going to um, use the, um, use some data from uh, this server here in terms of uh, the, the settings that need to be used for color calibration. Uh, so it needs to know where you're actually looking and what your image is of first. Um, so that this works quite nicely. And I use this sometimes, um, but I probably tend to use this one quite uh, quite often, to be honest. So everything that we've done so far um, has all been in what's called that linear space. So if I click this red button reset screen transfer function, everything goes black and <laughs> fortunately um, nothing's gone wrong. It's just you've been operating in this, this linear space. So um, the, the next stage um, we've got here is, is actually to do the stretch. And there's a couple of ways of doing stretching to get you to an image. So I guess um, just backtracking briefly, if you were to save this image and you go into, um, into save as, and then um, you try and save it as a JPEG, let's just do that very quickly. Uh, so in there, just call this test. Um, so in here we've got this uh, test. So the very first time I came in here, I opened this up and it's like, oh, it's it's all black. So I've made those changes and and nothing's worked. And this is fundamentally because you're you're making changes to a linear image and you haven't stretched it and you haven't applied those stretches to the image. So uh, that's that's the importance behind um, just doing this, at least this final step, and then at least you've got an image that you can view and you can share and, and you can show other people and things. Um, so there's there's two ways of doing this. There's, I would say the, the beginner's way, um, which this being a beginner's video, I think is the one that we should show. Um, and that's using um, a script called um, Part of Easy Processing Suite. So this is a, a free software suite. Um, you can add this by going into Resources, Updates, Manage Repositories, um, and adding this uh, URL um, to your repositories. So you just click on Add, type that URL in, hit OK, um, I think probably okay again. It will refresh the repository information. It will download the um, download the script and everything, and then um, you have to close down Pix Insight, reopen it again, and when you do that, um, it will add this script in, and you can see Easy Processing Suite. And there's a couple of things that I use in here quite heavily. So soft stretch is is that image stretching going from linear to non-linear. And then you've got uh, denoise, which I use quite heavily as well. And the denoise, um, obviously, well, might be obvious. It, it's there to get rid of um, all of the noise in the image, or get rid of as much noise in the image as possible, so that you have a nice, smooth, smooth image without losing all of the detail. So whenever you go from a noisy image to a, a not noisy image, it tends to blur things out, and it doesn't look as sharp and as, as refined. This easy denoise script um, allows you to do that. So onto soft stretch. So we open it up. 
and you can most of the time you can just literally take the defaults again these things are all things that you can play about with and see how you how you're happy with it but actually in reality i like the um i like the defaults that it gets it's less um aggressive a stretch compared to what we've just seen on the screen so if you so this is now a non-linear image and it's slightly darker than the one that we were looking at before so you can kind of still stretch the non-stretched image and you can see this is a bit brighter but the the benefit with this is what you're doing is you're stretching the entire image including all of the stars in that image and and that basically means that um when you when you stretch the stars and any kind of bright objects they get bigger and they get more um potentially blown out so if you have a weaker stretch and then you can do things like removing the stars from the image and which we'll show in a second um, you'll you'll then get an image without the stars and you can you can start to pull out the detail in the in the nebula um, nebulosity in the image or in a galaxy or something like that um, but you can still keep the stars nicely and controlled and then you add those stars back in and you end up with a, a more balanced image whereas if you do everything with the stars there um, you might find that uh, you end up with um, a bright background and a nice um, nice bright nebula but then also you've got really big stars that are a bit overpowering um, so this is the image that we've uh, got so far um, and we've used these processes here as well as a, a free script and then you can now save save this image and you can go to save as um, let's save it as that test image again replace that overwrite it and then if we go back to here open that up and you can see that it's now kind of a valid JPEG that you could share and this is this is a respectable enough image at the end of the day if you're new to this that um, sharing with people and it's like well that's that's fantastic to, to be able to share with with your friends and family and things Right, so the next step that we've got here is to, um, in, in the workflow that I'm introducing you to, is going to be to uh, remove the stars from the image, or separate the stars from the image. So in order to do this, uh, you've got a two different options. Um, if you're running a Windows machine or a Mac that's running on um, an Intel-based processor, then you can use a, um, a tool called Starnet++. Um, if you're running a, a Mac and um, it's using the new CPUs, the M1 and M2 based um, processors, uh, they don't work with Starnet++, um, so you have to look at something else. Uh, to do that, I used a tool called um, Star Exterminator. I'll provide a link into uh, into the description for this tool. Yeah, the reason for this is this, and you have to pay for this tool, I'm afraid, um, whereas uh, Starnet++ comes with PixInsight for free. It uses AI to uh, be able to extract the stars, um, and they do a lot of crazy things like sort of um, training that AI model with um, things like James Webb Space Telescope uh, to be able to handle the, the crazy diffraction spikes and things like that. Um, and yeah, this, this particular image was taken with a, a refractor telescope, so it doesn't have the diffraction spikes that you would get with a Newtonian telescope. Um, but it's fairly easy to use once you've, once you've um, added this plugin in and you've downloaded the um, AI model, which it says here, and this automatically updates for you now. Um, just make sure that generate star image is uh, ticked and unscreen stars is ticked and just drag the process onto the image and wait for it to complete. Um, it's relatively quick to uh, quick to run. And then once it's uh, finished running, then you end up with uh, two separate images. You've got the, the background, your nebula or your target, and then you've got the stars um, separate. So there we go. Um, and then we're just going to drag this process onto here, right click, set icon identifier star exterminator um, and you can place these icons where you want and, and different categories and I tend to <laughs> sometimes a bit randomly but um, 
yeah, you can sort of have them in different blocks so you can sort of see the different stages of your workflow, um, for example. Um, so we've got some nice stars here. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to minimize this window because we don't need this for now. Uh, so we'll click the shade, which drops it down to a bit of an icon bar, and then we can just put that to one side. I'm also going to remove these previews now because I don't need them. So click on the preview, right click on it, hit delete. Click on the preview, right click and hit delete. Um, it's also worth knowing as well, you can um, right click on here and change uh, identifier and you can you can give this window and this image a, a different name if you wanted to. We could call it Veil. Um, so you've got a shorter name to be able to see what you're playing with. Um, certainly, and then with, with this one, let's call this um, Let's open this and then just change this to stars or something. Uh, veil stars. Um, also, another good tip for anybody that's working um, on PixInsight, let's make sure that we're saving regularly. So when you're working with images, so you might come in with a TIFF file or a, um, a FIT file or something, um, you should be saving your images from PixInsight as XISF files. And then just uh, hit save, make sure it's 32 bit, hit OK. So we save the veil stars, let's save the veil as well. Um, over to that, save as. Um, and notice it's, it's kept its original file name, so it's not using the name that we've given it. Um, so just change that to veil, X. ISF format, save, 32-bit, OK. So at least if anything crashes, now we're in a good place. And let's let's save the icon files again. Just because we've made some changes. So we're in a good place. Let's uh, minimize that, put that up there. Um, and now we can start manipulating this image without impacting the stars as well. So the, the thing that you would do at this point, and the most, because um, if you, let's zoom into this image and you can see, hopefully in YouTube, you can, you'll be able to see um, the noise that's in that background. So this is a nine hour exposure or nine hour integration image. Um, so a, a reasonable amount of uh, time is spent sort of gathering data on this particular target, but it's still a little bit noisy. And as soon as you start to um, stretch this even further with the curves functions, um, you're, you're going to basically bring out that noise even more. So what we want to do first, uh, before we do anything else, is going into script, uh, down to easy processing suite, and run the easy denoise script. Um, you can, I'm going to hit that now because it takes quite some time basically accepting all of the defaults and then just leaving it at that. Um, so what this script is doing is basically just running a number of processes against this image um, automatically. And it's it's possible to, um, to denoise your image um, manually using all of the capabilities within PixInsight. It doesn't really um, require any, any intelligence, I think is probably the best way of putting it. Um, it's not necessarily subjective in terms of the, the differences that you might want to do to remove the noise. It's just a process that you have to go through. Um, so scripts like the Easy Denoise are, are fantastic from that point of view. Um, I also do have a tool down here um, by a company called Topaz. Um, and uh, Topaz Denoise uses um, AI, like everything seems to these days, uh, to, to denoise the image as well. And this uh, Topaz Denoise does actually work really, really well. But this is a PixInsight tutorial. so. It's worth having a look at that, downloading it. This is super fast compared to um, the denoise approach in PixInsight. Um, but uh, through the magic of YouTube, I'll just fast forward through this bit. I'm not sure if you'll be able to. Yes, it's running lots of different operations on the image. So you can see um, if I just undo a bit, you can see how it um, improves over time. Let's kind of zoom in a bit. Uh, go back a few, so that's what it looked like before. And then this is what it looked like afterwards. So it does a pretty good job. Um, so we've now got our denoised image and, and this would be a good 
um, time to actually save the image again. Uh, so let's just hit save as, fail, save, place. There we go, 32 bit. And we've got our nicely denoised image. So we can now start to play about with the image a little bit. Um, you've got a couple of options here. Um, there's many options. Uh, the main tool that I'll end up using um, in this tutorial is uh, Curves Transformation. Um, but you could you can use um, Curves Transformation. Uh, so if we, there's a new icon here in this particular tool you can see. Uh, there's a real-time preview, so if you open that, uh, when you start messing about, you can see changes to the image. Um, so a thing around uh, curves transformation, so if you're familiar with it from using things like um, Photoshop or Affinity Photo or um, any other photo editing, there's always some kind of curves related tool. Um, this one's equally as powerful, so you've got, um, you can mess around with uh, red, green and blue channels, you can do the whole set of channels, you've got um, saturation here, um, and you've got the CIEC component which kind of um, ultimately just sort of boosts boosts saturation but in a different way. So you've got a number of different things to play with there as well, um, and if you were messing around with this and then you sort of go, oh gosh this looks terrible, just click this button, button in the bottom right hand corner of reset and it goes back to the way it was. So when you're using curves in this way, um, you can you can adjust the whole image um, to as much as you want. And if you want to apply this particular change, you can just hit apply, and then just keep doing it to as as much as you want. Um, and then obviously this is this is way too far. Um, but you're you're applying curves to the entirety of the image. So if we just jump back a few. Um, steps. So that was the last, yeah, so there's no curves um, done there. So that's that's one option. Let's just drag this triangle down to here. So, uh, so we've got this later on for our process. Save this and just call that curves. So you can actually do things, um, a thing called range selection. So if you go up to processes um, and scroll down, eventually somewhere you'll find uh, range selection. Um, what this enables you to do is to um, select using just um, upper and lower limits uh, what you want to actually operate on. So this particular thing will be just like um, everything. And then when you start moving this range you can see how it's only going to impact um, the, the core parts of um, the veil nebula. And then you've got um, aspects of, uh, you can start changing the fuzziness and the smoothness um, so you don't have like harsh lines where um, you're making changes and it's uh, not impacting the bit in the background. Um, so you can play around with this and you can kind of come up with a, a nice suitable um, mask to work with uh, that enables you to, to boost the detail um, in the in the main part of the image without impacting the background. And you can see I've got some kind of what will probably be like vignetting coming into the image as well, um, which is causing some issues. But let me just apply that mask. So hitting the square, that will create that mask. So not the best mask in the world, but um, it's at least showing you what you can do. You can also now save this mask as a, um, as a TIFF file. And then you can open that up in your favourite imaging editing software, and you can you can tweak this mask a bit more if you wanted to, um, and then you can bring that back in um, into PixInsight, and you can apply that mask. Um, I don't actually like that mask. I'm just going to create another one quickly. Uh, so let's not be so aggressive on uh, the background. It's a little bit better. What I would have liked to have got is this this part of the veil down the middle, but um, yeah, this demonstration isn't a demonstration of how I got my final image. Uh, so we'll go with that. It's good enough for this demonstration. So we have our mask. Um, we now need to apply it, um, and that's very simply done by 
taking this mask, holding onto that, and you can now drag it around, and you can see that you've grabbed hold of that mask, and you put it into this bar just beneath where Veil is. So anywhere in this section here. And you can see that the mouse pointer changes, and then when you release it, um, you get this crazy red image. You need to keep this image, the you need to keep the mask image open. You can't close it because it's being used. Um, so just use the shade and just minimize it and put it somewhere else. Um, so I mentioned the mask menu um, uh, previously. So this is where you can control this particular mask. And there'll be a number of things like, um, yep, the red's quite distracting, so you might not want to see the mask. Um, so you can show and hide it. It might be that you've made some changes um, to the areas that are highlighted and actually you want to um, invert the mask so that you can now make the changes to the areas that aren't in the mask. Um, so that's equally as useful. Um, and then you can just enable and disable and also um, remove that mask as well. So uh, what we're going to do now is just um, open the curves again, open the preview, and you'll be able to see this time that when we make changes here, you can see that those changes are only being made and only being applied to the sort of unmasked areas. Uh, so the mask is being applied. So that's great. It gives you that finer control in terms of what's going on in this image. Um, I'll just make some rough adjustments and <laughs> really it's, um, yeah, just, just to give you a feel for what you can do. Um, it, let's say as well, if you if you wanted to um, just boost the red parts of of the nebula, and yeah, you wouldn't want to do that, but uh, or not to that extent, but it, it gives you that capability as well. So that's that's one thing you can do. We can apply those changes now. Um, we can now take this image clip click on that image, so I've just selected the image in the background, let's close that actually, select that image, let's invert the mask, open up the preview again, um, this is where we want to use the reset because obviously you don't want to do that to the background, and then maybe we might want to reduce the background so it's not so bright and then the nebula stands out a bit more. Um, so that's just a little bit of a demonstration around the use of masks the use of mask with curves transformation. Um, so, yeah, maybe we want to reset this. I want to put this in here. Save this as, um, we could call it range selection, or you could call it um, nebula masking or something. Um, so you, you don't have to call it what the process is actually called. You can call it something that's a bit more useful. Um, and then you've got, you've got a bit of a flow here. So, Yep, we've, we've removed the stars. Sadly, you can't create processes for scripts, which is a bit of a shame, um, because it would be nice to have everything all here so you know exactly what you need to do, but you'll remember it. Um, create a nebula, ma nebula mask, uh, operate sort of curves um, on it to as much as you want. And then there are a number of other things. Uh, it all comes down to the image as well, um, as to whether these sorts of things are, are particularly nice and, and work or not. They tend to work quite nicely with galaxies, but um, if you pick up HDR multi-scale transform. Um, so if you had an image where um, you want to create a bit more of an HDR type feel to it, to a bit more detail out of darker areas and retain the highlights and things, then you can you can use this particular tool. Um, again, there's an awful lot in this that's just like, oh, what's it even doing? Um, and this tends to just be sort of trial and error. I tend to find that um, tweaking the number of layers, um, anywhere between six and eight, um, and again, it all depends on the images and it's just a bit of experimentation. Um, you can sort of run this and you might find that it actually it actually sort of boosts the level of detail that you're after and so therefore that's a, a nice way of um, manipulating the image. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. I think the uh, jury might be out on this one. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of, this, this particular thing has sort of bought a lot of uh, localised detail out um, in the nebula 
area, but then you've got this really nasty dark halo around the nebula, so yeah, in reality that's not worked, but I forgot to save that one. So this is just kind of save this process on here, right click, set icon identify to HDR. Um, and you know you've got that and you can remember, oh I might give that a try and see if that works. Uh, the other one uh, that's quite useful is um, local histogram equalization. Is a, every, everything in PixInsight has a really long name that, that to most people doesn't mean mean much. Um, you could probably say that this this tool's a way of kind of building a bit more contrasty um, feel um, to areas where there's, there's there could be some detail that could be brought out. Um, so this this particular tool works really nicely with uh, with M31, for example. Um, but again, it's it's all about sort of playing with these settings and and trying not to overcook certain things because I think sometimes, um, yeah, it, people just get carried away. Um, and I think this <laughs> this image, I'm not massively happy with what this is looking like at the moment. But it's really just to show you, yep, you've got things like local histogram equalization. Um, that's that's nice to bring out some sort of local detail. Um, and local contrast to things. Uh, so we'll just save this one as well. Local histogram equalization. Uh, so we've got that to that to play about with as well. So the home straight with this now. I think we've um, been through a few things with this um, the, the the background and the nebula, and we're just gonna. Make a few changes to the stars so that um, they're still there, but they're not as prominent as uh, as they currently are. So what we want to do now is um, with the stars, go into the process menu and find a process called multi no morphological transform. Um, and what this what you can do with this is. Um, there's a number of operations in here that you can do um, effectively on, on stars and things, and you can change um, the definition of the star and how defined they are and things. But again, it all works quite nicely on, on default. Um, I think the only thing that, that's worth sort of playing about with is, is the amount, so the intensity of what you're actually doing. So if we uh, take this process and drag the triangle onto it, and um, you can see here that we've reduced the stars quite significantly, and if you if you want to do that, that's fine, and and we can just have a quick look to see what that looks like, um, and this will be the final part of the video, which is um, introducing a thing called pixel math, um, and there's you could do an entire detailed video just on pixel math and its capabilities. Um, but what we're essentially just going to do here is um, take this image, add that image, and um, and then see what we get. So that's merged the stars into the final image, and yeah, okay, that actually looks quite nice. Um, sometimes I find it's a bit too overpowering, and it just looks like there's not enough stars there. Um, so I tend to play about with the amount. And I might drop it down to about 80% or something like that. Um, apply that. And then go on to here, run that again. And it feels like it's a bit more like, yeah, it's in space. There are some stars there. Um, but they're not dominating the, the final image. So I've, I've really rushed through that, that final piece there. Um, but again, it's worth um, taking morphological transform. And I'll probably rename this to Star Reduction, um, so that at least you remember what that does. And we can close that and clear this again and stick Pixel Math here as well. So I identify to Pixel Math. Um, and then those are the, the last two things in a 
what I would say is a very simple workflow. Um, let's save our process icons. So, um, yeah, I think we've we've ended up with a fairly respectable image. Um, it's not going to win the APODs just yet, but uh, at least you've got a bit of a feel for how to use PixInsight, um, how to set up your workspace, how to use some of the tools. Um, just be aware that, yep, there's a ton of tools in here that do many, many, many different things. Um, some around sort of pre-processing of an image, some around post-processing of an image. Um, you can also now, um, you've got this as a as an EXIF that we'll save again, um, but you can save that as a TIFF. You can then take that into Photoshop or Affinity Photo. Uh, you can manipulate it further, or you can just save it as a JPEG and then share it on social media or whatever you want to do with it. Um, I think sort of one one final thing. So you've got this, this pixel math here. Um, if I just load uh, my process icons, which... I can share those with the world as well if uh, if you might find it useful. I can put a link to that in the description as well as the one that we've created today. Um, you can see here there's um, we've got a number of masks here, so you could create a using pixel math. You can create a mask um, which just isolates um, the red in the image or the yellow, green, cyan, blue, magenta, um, and that that will fundamentally help you. Um, you can apply those masks and you can um, sort of apply that to the image, then use curve transformations to, to pull out further detail and things like that as well. Um, so it's it's just to know that pixel math can do um, lots of different things. It can combine images, it can help you create a, um, a an HARGB image, which may or may not mean anything to you. Um, so if you've got, uh, say, a galaxy and you want to pull out some of the, uh, the the hydrogen alpha nebula detail within a galaxy and you've taken some HA and you've got a broadband image, you can combine those together in pixel math as well. So there's uh, tons of stuff that you can do in that. Yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. I hope you uh, found this, uh, this video useful. Um, and I think uh, what would be nice is if, um, yeah, you just... Uh, run through this, uh, take the uh, the sample image that I've provided um, and and maybe sort of share your images and your resulting images on uh, on social media and sort of uh, tag uh, Astro Journey UK um, and just let me know how you get on. And also don't forget to put something in the comments in terms of how you get on, uh, whether you felt this, uh, this tutorial was useful, um, if there's anything that you'd like to see in more detail then uh, let me know and I can do a video on that too. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much for watching and clear skies.